Let's take the word of God together again and turn to the 13th chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 13. I want to draw your attention just to one verse, and then we will read the passage as we expound the text. But I want to draw your attention to verse number 12 of Acts 13. The word of God says in verse 12, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. I want to take for our subject or our title today, the astonishment of belief, the astonishment of belief. In this passage, as we read through it here in just a few moments, we see that through the preaching of the word and through the obedience of the apostle Paul and of Barnabas, uh, they are sent out from the church at Antioch. And as they are sent out, they are stopping along the way in various locations and they're stopping in the synagogues and they are preaching the word. And oftentimes, I think when we consider the act of preaching itself, uh, we think about it as an event that's really going on and there really is no visible opposition that's taking place. In other words, we feel relatively comfortable today that as the word's going forth, that it is accomplishing. We know the passages that the word of God never returns void, that it goes forth and it always accomplishes what it is intended to accomplish. Uh, we believe that, and I believe that wholeheartedly, that the word of God never fails. Uh, not a single person who is intended to be brought to salvation uh, is left behind or is left out. However, something I've been thinking a lot about, especially when I got to this particular chapter and I knew we were coming upon this, was that sometimes I think we can fall into the trap of thinking, well, all things are. And because we know the promises that the word of God is going to be accomplished, uh, we don't really have to be concerned about what's happening when the word of God is being preached. Now, I don't want to be cute today and think about all the different things we could point to and talk about distractions and talk about things that could happen that might take our attention away uh, from the preaching. But what I do want us to think about, and this passage gives us some evidence of this, is that there is in reality, every time the word of God is being preached, especially when the gospel is going forth, there is a battle that is taking place for the soul. Now, we may not be aware of it, and we may not always see it, and we may not feel it. Matter of fact, in a comfortable environment with when most of us all know each other, we know each other rather well, we, we're pretty convinced we know of each other's salvation, we know whether we're saved or unsaved. Sadly, in a, in a small church, sometimes we know so much about people that we often think, well, who is this really for then? I'm looking around and I'm not seeing unsaved people. I'm looking around today, and I'm, I'll be honest with you, I don't see any visitors today. I don't see anybody who we have not met. We are all very well knowledgeable of each other. And it's in these moments where we might say, there's really, this is comfortable, there's nothing happening, there's nothing being opposed, because there's no obvious sinner amongst us who is still without Christ that we know of. Now, we understand for our younger ones and our little ones, we are all praying to that end that our children would be saved at the appointed hour. And even if it was only for their sake that we're preaching the word, then we preach the word for their sake, that they might hear and they may grow up in the admonition and the nurture of the Lord. But I want us to understand that any time a soul comes to know Christ, any time the eyes are opened, to be able to see the glorious truths and to hear the gospel clearly. When I might say, when our soul is overwhelmed by the gospel of Jesus Christ and the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit of God, I want you to understand there was a battle that was going on. Now we know Christ gets the victory in all things and we serve a Christ who is victorious. But I don't think we should discount and I don't think we should just lessen the reality of what's actually going on in the spiritual realm when a soul is being fought for. If the preaching of the word was not the means in which God gave for the gospel to go forth, then he would not have commanded it to be the means in which are to go forth. We very much support the preaching of the word. 
We support the fact that even every time we gather together, the center emphasis of why we're here is the preaching of the word. Our emphasis is the word of God. But we should never cease to praise God for the reality of what happened to us if we are truly converted. Because even in our own life, there was a battle raging for our soul, even though we couldn't see it. Now, whether that battle was internal with our old nature, or it was the work of the princes and the powers and the principalities of the air, which again, I think most Christians take much too lightly. We don't realize that the things in which are going on in our world, that there is literally a battle going on. Now, in this meeting we're going to read about today, you can see the battle actually happening. We have the privilege of looking back, but I want you to think about Saul and Barnabas as they come upon this man, this deputy. But at the same time, they are also met by a sorcerer. And that sorcerer has evil and wicked intent. And it says it in our text that we're going to see it. His intent was to turn the deputy away from the faith. His entire intent was to turn this deputy away. So I think because of the omnipotent power of God that we all recognize today, sometimes we fall into the trap. Well, salvation isn't of me anyway. God always wins. So whoever will be saved will be saved. And brethren, I think that's dangerous to not consider. That doesn't mean that there's not a war raging. And it doesn't mean that we should not be aware of it. You know, some of you in your own testimonies towards me, when you've talked about other people that you've been praying about being saved and converted and conversations you've had, and you've told me situations where even family members were reacting very wickedly towards you because you talked to them about Christ. I want you to understand because it's a spiritual battle. This is not just a battle for logic. It's not just a battle for reason. It's a battle for the soul. Now, I believe there is a portion of our coming to understand Christ's reason and logic. I don't think we should discount them. But sometimes we're arguing with the idea that I am going to reasonably make your logic soften to what the message of the gospel is. That's a work of the Spirit. So it's been on my mind this week to think about how much we fall into the trap of thinking salvation is just easy. Because God always gets his way. I think it should be the reverse. It should lead us to our own astonishment that we've been saved in this present world. There's a battle going on in the spiritual realm. If we simply treat the saving of a soul, if God will, we lose our own astonishment over our own salvation. Again, I believe in the all-powerful God. I believe in the hymns that we sing, Behold Our God. I believe that. But I also believe that we've got to be on guard. Now, we understand, as we're going to read here in just a moment, Saul and Barnabas are sent out from Antioch, which we're familiar with Antioch over the last few weeks. The Bible clearly says that they were separated by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to, we'll talk about that when we get to it in just a moment. But our emphasis primarily is going to be on this meeting between the sorcerer, Saul, Barnabas, and this deputy by the name of Sergius Paulus. It's a remarkable account. And again, it's not a story. It's a factual event. This is not given to us in hyperbole. It's not given to us as an allegory. This is an actual event that took place. And what was happening it certainly should be noted by us. So I want us to think with this aim in mind, the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ is always opposed with an attempt to turn away the hearer from the faith. The gospel being preached is always opposed with an attempt to turn away the hearer from the faith. So first of all, in these first five verses, we see there is this directive of the Spirit towards Saul and Barnabas. It says in verse one of, of Acts 13, now there were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger and Lucius of Siren and Manan, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch and Saul. 
as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed unto Seleucia and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews and they had also John to their minister. So we see that as Saul and Barnabas are separated by the Holy Spirit, notice it says the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. This is directly a call of the Lord by the Spirit to Saul and Barnabas to this particular work. Now we know, just by means of context, the Apostle Paul wrote a little bit about his initial calling to preach in Galatians chapter number one, if you want to turn there, verses 15 and 16. Uh, Paul, in one of the times in his letters where he gave testimony about not only his conversion, but also his calling. And he says in verse 15 of Galatians one, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. So Saul was very much aware of the calling and the separating work of the Holy Spirit of God to preach the gospel. Uh, these men are going out uh, under the call of the Spirit in order to do the work of the Spirit, which is the preaching of the word. Now, the, notice that the church in Antioch, by this calling, right, verse 3 says that when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. This church at Antioch understood and realized the separating work of the Spirit to send them out. They fasted, they prayed, they laid hands. Laying of hands here is nothing more than symbolic of saying these men have the approval to go out and to preach the word. Now, ultimately, it's a spirit that called, uh, but the church was also very much active in the sending forth. Now, the Holy Spirit's the one that calls, uh, but don't ever lose sight of the fact that it's also the church which is sending forth preachers and sending forth those who are going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there is this direction of the Spirit. So we know wherever the Spirit's directing, uh, we know that there is an intent as to why that call is occurring. Where they go, in the order in which they go, is being led by the Holy Spirit of God. So it is in these verses, in verse 6 through 13, after they've preached in Seleucia, after they've preached at Salamis, they preach the word of God in the synagogues. They also, it says, as a note here, that they had John to their minister. So John enters into this equation as well. But then you notice in verse 6, uh, we see that now their leading by the Spirit brings them to a certain place called Paphos. Verse 6, and when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew. I think that's important to note. Whose name was Bargesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So we have this false prophet here, this man by the name, this sorcerer who is not named yet, but he is identified as a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus. And so we're going to introduce what happens during this divine appointment, if you will. So notice that verse eight says, but Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them. Okay, that's the, it's the idea of opposition. It's with the intent of hindering. It's with the intent of stopping. It's with the intent of keeping whatever is getting ready to be done from happening. It would be much like setting a blockade, trying to stop the progress of what's happening here. And you'll notice his intent is told, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. In other words, this sorcerer is using all means necessary, doing all he can to keep 
faith and to keep the conversion, to keep this deputy from belief. Now, again, oftentimes, I don't think we take it seriously enough about the battle and the war that's going for the soul and that there is a very real intent to turn away the hearer. Uh, there's a really an intent to make us I just, I don't want to accept. I don't want to believe. I don't want to go forward. Now, again, we know and believe in the sovereignty of God. If we didn't believe in that, we wouldn't pray for God to open eyes and God to open ears to hear. The Holy Spirit would give them, making them willing to believe. We would be praying things like this. Help them to make a decision for Christ today. Now, that's not what we're praying. We're praying with, no, it's the power of God that must open the eyes. It's the power of God to the Holy Spirit that must convince the sinner we're not asking people to make a choice for Christ today. But there is a seeking for the sinner to be turned away. And there's no doubt about it. If Satan himself could turn away every hearer, he would. Now keep in mind, Satan can't turn away the sinner from the power of the gospel. Now he can do things to try to withstand, but also understand that Satan is not an omnipresent being. Satan is not in every place, everywhere at the same time, equally like God himself is. But he does have angels. He does have demonic spirits. He does have those others that are going out with the intent of turning away people from hearing. Now, again, sometimes even in our own lives, we've got to keep in mind that uh, sometimes we, we blame some kind of a spiritual attack as to the reason why we turn ourselves away from hearing the word, the reality is that sometimes it's our old Adamic nature that just keeps us and we turn ourselves away. We discount what it means to come and hear the word of God preached. Now, again, I'm speaking out of love to all of us today. There are times we as Christians discount the importance of being and hearing the word of God preached as believers. This 1130 service, as you realize, is intentionally almost always evangelistic in its nature and in its point, and that's on purpose. But it wouldn't be something that's lessened because we're already saved. So we shouldn't look at this and say, well, that's the time that really the lost people need to be here. No, we all need to hear the word of God preach, whether we're converted or not. Because even if it's just a reminder that the blood of Christ has secured us, has removed and provided remission of our sins. There's not a believer anywhere that does not need to be encouraged by that. But yet we see the very characteristics of what this sorcerer, what means he tried to take to turn away this deputy. Now, notice in verse number nine, then Saul, who also is called Paul. Now, you realize after this point, and my intent today is not to get into the weeds about why Paul called himself this or why the Bible said that. You can study that on your own. It's not relevant to what we're talking about today. Filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes upon him. Now, all we're told here is this is, this is a look. Uh, this, this word, set his eyes upon, it, it means to look with intent intentionally that's the margin note so that's a simple that's a simple translation of what he means there but then notice what he says to him he identifies the very tricks that the sorcerer is using notice he says verse 10 oh full of all subtlety and all mischief those two words subtlety and mischief are clearly defined as simply meaning by fraud and deceit the intent is to deceive, and in order to deceive, you do it by fraud. The means in which the sorcerer is using, we're not told exactly, but he's full of this, and Saul, by the power and the sermon of the Holy Spirit, identifies exactly what he's doing. He also tells the sorcerer what he is. Thou child of the devil. He's not pulling any punches with that, is he? He's telling the sorcerer, you are filled with deceit. You are filled with fraud. You are a child of the devil. Now that's relevant because we saw that he was a Jew, right? Here's this Jewish false prophet who's using all means necessary and all means possible. He's using fraud. He's using deceit. 
Now, again, I believe in the ultimate power of God unto salvation. But to think for one minute that when a sinner comes into this building and is hearing the word of God and is in an unconverted state, to think that there is not things to turn them away from the faith happening would be ignorance, willful ignorance on our part. There is a intent to turn away from the faith any and all possible who can be turned away. But notice that as Paul continues, he says, not only are you a child of the devil, right? You're, you're, that child is, indicates relationship. You're a, you're a, in this case, you're a son of the devil. Thou enemy of all righteousness. You are the exact enemy of the cross. You're the enemy of Christ. You, in what you're doing, is the exact opposite of all that is good and holy and pure and righteous. You're the son of the devil, and you are anything but righteous. You are the exact opposite. You're the enemy of righteousness. Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Now, this is interesting because the word pervert here, we think about the word in our, in our normal English as perversion, and we think about something being twisted, and that's true. But even, again, if you have a margin note in your Bible, it may say something along the lines to make crooked. Now, combine that with what the recipe, to pervert the right ways, the word right there means straight, so what Saul identifies and what the, the enemy, the sorcerer, is doing is he is seeking to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord. It's his whole intent. What's he using? He's using fraud. He's using deceit. He's using trickery. He's using any means necessary with what intention? To turn away the deputy from the faith. Now, sometimes we think, after we've been converted, I don't have to worry about being turned away. Brother, this is the danger that we get in when we start to believe, and I am a firm believer in the reality of the sovereignty of God, the providence of God, the decrees of God. I believe that once you are in Christ, there is the perseverance of the saints, although I would tell you perseverance does not mean you sit back and do nothing and say, God's going to keep me, so all I got to do is just coast. No, perseverance means we should be striving to stay and remain faithful to God. Yet sometimes, in our desire to just coast along, we think, well, the Bible says if I'm truly saved, I'm going to persevere. I don't have to worry about ever being turned away. Brother, most people who have made a profession of faith and have walked with Christ for any amount of time are not turned away because of fraud and deceit. They're turned away by their own thought of their mind saying, I don't need to persevere in this. And it leads us to just simply say, I'm safe in Christ. Now, oftentimes we sometimes, and I think we need to be careful about this, we will we'll heckle the once saved, always saved crowd. But here's what I want you to understand. You can treat the perseverance of the saints that way to where you just say, all I got to do is lay back and coast in my Christian life and God's going to, I'm going to persevere to the end. Yet Hebrews has warnings about those tasting of heavenly gifts and work, talks about things that uh, this, is, this is not something to be taken for granted. <clears throat> or to think that after you're converted, the enemy just gives up and doesn't try to keep you, if can't turn you away from your salvation, but can certainly turn you away from the things of God. And it has happened. And yet, this was with the intent of turning the deputy away from the faith by making crooked the straight ways of the Lord. Now, this is subtle in our churches today where men are taking truths that are direct, truths that are clear, and they're just putting a slight bend in them. They're taking a truth and they'll take it and they'll take it to an extreme that ultimately what it does, it takes away the straight word of God and turns it into something that's corrupted. Just a little. 
Now, again, I believe that primarily comes in the form of the gospel. Because if I can just twist it a little, even introduce into you that your work save you, I have made crooked the straight ways of the Lord. The Bible is very clear about where salvation is, in, in whom salvation comes from, the regenerating work of the Spirit. It is not to be questioned. I said it last week and I'll say it again. The, the belief that works save you is an absolute demonic thought process. It's demonic to even think for a moment, but it's also the Adamic nature that can convince me that I can do a work of righteousness. Now, I think it's important that the Bible points out the enemy of all righteousness. Uh, this sorcerer had no intent whatsoever of giving this man any truth at all. His intent was to deceive by subtlety, by fraud. And again, we have to examine it and look at it. He's perverting the truth. So the war for the soul here is on display. And the war is happening and it's real. There's enemies who truly despise Christ and despise the cross. The enemies will use any means necessary to turn away anyone they can from the faith. Again, do we believe that they can oppose God and win? No, because I'm going to show you from the text, we see how quickly. <coughs> now, Paul is given a power here to be able to do something that you and I don't have the power to do. But as an apostle, he had the ability to do it. And watch how quickly, and I love the way the Bible describes this. He asked the question in verse 10. And now, verse 11, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. Now that's frightening to have the hand of the Lord upon me in the form, in the sense that he's saying here. This is not the hand of the Lord upon you in blessing. This is the hand <clears throat> upon you in wrath, in judgment pouring out his indignation. To present God in our churches today as a God who is not angry. No, speaking in the manner of men, he doesn't get angry like you and I do. But he's angry for his glory. He will not share his glory with anyone. Just like we saw Herod last week. Remember, he took all the praise and they treated him like a God and he did not do anything to turn away their worship, what happened to him? He was struck dead by the power of God. The hand of the Lord was upon Herod. Well, the hand of the Lord is also upon him, Paul says. Notice he goes on and he says, not only thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season, and immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Immediately, he is struck with this blindness. He is struck in the presence of Saul and the deputy and Barnabas. This man, this sorcerer, is brought to judgment right in front of them. Now, I wasn't going to say anything else about that, but again, there's, there's a note, a margin note in most Bibles that leads us to a text reference, which takes us to 1 Samuel chapter 5, which illustrates the hand of the Lord being upon a person or upon something, all right? So turn to 1 Samuel 5. I thought this was important enough that we need to see it. It may be familiar to you, and if it is, that's tremendous. That's what it should be. Uh, but you'll notice that this is the account of when the Philistines had taken the ark. And there's something that happens with that ark of the covenant and happens with their gods. Uh, 1 Samuel 5, verse 1. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Now remember, the ark of the covenant, especially in the Old Testament there, was a sign of the presence of God. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and set him in his place again. 
And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon, both the palms of his hands, were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon, nor any that come into Dagon's house, tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, the ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon, our God. They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, what shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? They answered, let the ark of God of Israel be carried back, carried about unto Gath. And they carried the ark of the God of Israel about hither. And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emeralds in their secret parts. It goes on to talk about the hand of God was very heavy. The entire chapter is an illustration of the hand of God's judgment being upon the enemies of God. No doubt this man is being treated as an enemy of God. Saul says so much. Saul says the enemy of all righteousness. Anyone who would try to attempt to even turn away someone from the faith is an enemy of God. And we see the result. We see that this man immediately is struck by the judgment and the wrath of God. He seeks someone to lead him by the hand. Obviously tells us that he is blind, uh, by physically blind. He cannot see. But then we have this glorious truth in verse 12. Then the deputy when he saw what was done, what a glorious word, believed. Being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. He saw what was happening. The deputy surges Paul is believed and he was astonished at the power of the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ that was being demonstrated before him. He saw this man by the words of Saul being struck blind. This man, the sorcerer, who had gone and done everything he could to try and turn away this man from the faith. There are things in this world that we unfortunately have started to believe that there's no danger in even just uh, experimenting with. And uh, parents, I've told you this and I'm going to tell you again, it is not an experiment that is innocent to experiment, experiment with sorcery. And things that are related to sorcery. I'm amazed at how many sorcery illustrations preachers are using from the pulpit to illustrate the truths of God by using sorcery books, movies, dramas, whatever you want. Why? <laughs> the Bible doesn't need, the God doesn't need your illustrations from sorcerers. Again, label that however you want. But to think that there's no danger in that. Again, think about what we will as parents keep our children from, but we as adults, we think there's no danger in that. This man's a Christian. I would advise you to really do your research on what we've labeled as who Christians are and what we've labeled as Christian books and things like that. Okay, maybe that's for another message, but I thought it was important. So this is an astonishing work. As quickly as this man believes, as quickly as this man, Paul and his company are loosed from Paphos. They come to Perga in Pamphyla. John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. And we'll pick up with our text next week in verse 14. But let me just conclude by thinking about how astonishing it is that the battle that's raging for the soul of every individual ought to bring us to a place where we understand that this real battle that was very raging in us, it should bring us to a deeper worship and a deeper adoration for the work that's been done in us. 
It should bring us to a place when we realize what we read in Hebrews 9, and we're going to see it even more fully in Hebrews 10 in our reading next week. Sin has separated us in a way that we could not bridge that gulf. We could not bridge that gap. Brother, what's falling silent from a lot of pulpits is the reality of sin, the abomination of sin, and that sin is not just some mistake that you made. It is the very thing that separates you from the holiness of God and separates you from him. If your sin is not dealt with, your sin in its uh, carrying out of and the guilt of your sin is not dealt with, you have no place nor can you be in the presence of God which means you have to have a means in which not only is the guilt of sin removed, but the sin is removed, right? This should bring us to a place that no matter what we offer, no matter what we present, no matter what we say, again, the demonic thought that works can save us. Your works, no matter how good and applauded they are, will never, ever, ever get you any closer to God. What you and I cannot deal with is our own sin. I would take one step further and say, not only can you not deal with your own sin, you can't deal with the guilt aspect of it. You cannot deal with the guilt that sin actually brings. You are guilty before a holy God. And no amount of offering, no amount of self-sacrifice, no amount of, uh, of, of crushing of yourself physically can deal with the spiritual problem that you have. Your spiritual problem is you're a sinner. Your spiritual problem is, is that you can't deal with your sin. You can't take away even a drop of guilt. But Christ, the blood of Christ, cleanses from all unrighteousness. He who says he's without sin is a liar. And yet, there's nothing we can do, and yet there's always the tendency to believe that I can somehow deal with the guilt of my sin. Now, Hebrews 10, we'll read next week, goes on in verse 4 and actually says, For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Notice the emphasis is on it's not possible. It's not possible that the blood of a goat, the blood of a bull can take away. But then as we read in our scripture reading in Hebrews 9, 26 through 28, Talking of Christ, it says he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Sin is only put away with by the sacrifice of Christ himself, period. And interestingly enough, the writer of Hebrews goes on after, immediately after stating that. Immediately after stating that he hath appeared, Christ has appeared by sin, or put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, he had then gives us the reality of what's coming. As it is appointed unto man once to die. You can see the connection, right? You can see the connection between there's an appointment with death that we cannot change. And that appointment of death and the following that comes in these verses is dependent upon the putting away sins of what eternity is going to be. It's a direct connection. He's a... He is appointed unto man once to die, but after this is the judgment. Not there might be a judgment. Not there might be something we're going to face. After this appointment with death, there is the judgment. What is the judgment? The judgment is going to be based upon, was your sin put away by the blood of Christ? Not what did you do? Not who did you know? Not how much did you give? Not how long you were a pillar in the church? not even whether you were baptized, did the blood of Christ cleanse you from all unrighteousness? Did Christ die for you? The guilt and its consequences of sin can only be put away by the blood of Christ. There's an appointment with death. There's an appointment with judgment. And then we have the glorious truth. So Christ, just as where men are appointed once to die, it goes on and says Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Of many. We don't know how many that is, but many means without number 
We don't have an exact number, but it says that he has, he has offered to bear the sins of many. He was once offered, not like the blood of the bulls and the goats that the priest had to take in once a year. And he had to atone for his own sin. And unto them, listen, that look to him. Again, we get labeled very wrongly by a lot of circles. You don't believe in a whosoever. That's a whosoever statement right there. Whoever looks to him shall be, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Yes, the eyes have to be opened by the Lord. The eyes of salvation have to be given. We have to receive the gift of faith, the gift of repentance. But if you will look to him, you will be saved. Not because you're a good person, not because you come from a good family. One of the great things we ought to examine ourselves about is what the reality of what we believe as a church and what the public actually believes. Sometimes we think everybody believes this way. No, they don't believe this way. You have friends and family members who right this very minute are relying on their works to get them to heaven. And they've attended church all their life. You say that church over there is just like us. They believe the same thing that we do. If they believe works get them any sort of saving favor with God, we don't believe the same way. Brethren, the, the movement to pull all churches together just under the name of God, and now it's even moved into this realm, we all love Jesus. Some love Jesus just because they wanted to make their life here better. We love Jesus Christ because he has once been offered and he put away our sin. Our prayer today would be simply that if you are without Christ today, there is a battle. You may not see it. You may not be aware of it. But the worst that we could hear is that we are dead in our trespasses and sins and it's only the blood of Christ that can take away the sin and can take away the guilt. Oftentimes we leave people wondering, what do I do? Again, because we're afraid to use the term, what do I do? Remember the account with the Philippian jailer? We'll talk about it a little bit later. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He asked a what should I do question. He wasn't asking about what can I earn. So what do you do today? If you're not saved, if you're not converted, you're not a child of God. What do you do? You repent and you believe the gospel. You say, I just can't believe. You plead with God to give you eyes and ears of understanding. Somehow that's fallen out of favor, even our reformed churches. If you will not believe right now, plead with God to give you eyes to see. I've watched people, when you give that kind of instruction to plead with God to give you eyes to believe, I've watched them turn, their, I've watched them turn away and say, I, I don't want to do that. Don't blame God for your lack of unbelief. Give me eyes to see. Give me ears to hear. Help thou my unbelief. The man that so beautifully pled for his own son. Parents, pray for your children. Plead with God that they would give them understanding. Not just some, dear God, save my kids. Pleading with God to save my children. These babies that are in this room, pray for them that they will be saved. The preciousness of looking out and seeing these children, it's overwhelming to me. To see these children that need Christ for themselves. We ought to be praying diligently, not just for the adults, but the children that at the appointed time that Christ would give them eyes to see, ears to hear. Give me eyes and open the way of understanding. One thing I did not mention when we were looking at that, I love what it said in verse seven, and we'll close. It talks about Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, it means this is a man of intelligence who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. He sought it. Where did that desire to hear come from? It came from God himself. If you're seeking to hear the word, that's a gift of God himself. 
May God help us to understand if we're in Christ and may God help you to understand today if you are dead in your trespasses and sins, today the command, as it always is said here, is to repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's conclude our time today by singing the hymn in hymn.